Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Sammy Marandino, Sean McDaniel, and Warren Owens in a Broadway Drummer's Roundtable. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting edition of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from several cities today. Jim McCarthy, my co-host, coming from beautiful Music City, USA, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Jim, what's happening? Oh, same old, same old. How are you? Well, we just chatted with uh, Nate Morton, the drummer for NBC's The Voice yeah. for the last decade or so. That was a great conversation. And it really, I mean, it was a great time, but about 45 minutes in, it started taking on a, a whole new life. And, and I was like, we got to go. We got to go. We went in a lot of areas. Yeah. We did hit a lot of areas. And for uh, there's a lot of drum podcasts out there. And I think that people might complain about this show because we don't talk about widgets and gear and pedal tension and diddles. And if you guys are into that kind of stuff, this is not the show for you. This is where we talk about big picture stuff, music, motivation, and success. We talk to comedians, authors, thought leaders, drummers, lots of drummers. And I haven't heard this before. This hasn't been done. But today, Jim, we've got a Broadway drummer roundtable. Now, we're not talking lower Broadway, area code 615, Nashville, Tennessee. There's a tear in my beer, Broadway. We're talking about <laughs> New York, New York, Manhattan, the Big Apple. We're not talking about about it. We're talking Broadway. These three drummers play. Good pizza. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah they can, we can talk about the which one yeah. is the original Rays, all that kind of stuff. But our guest today, longtime friend, Sammy Marandino, before this all went crazy, he's still attached to the show. We're just waiting for the apocalypse to, to go away. Diana the Musical, our friend Sean McDaniel, Frozen, and our, our new friend Warren Odes, King Kong. Welcome, friends. How are you doing? Good. Thanks Good, for having man. us. Good. Yeah, thank you for uh, Sammy for kind of hurting the cats, getting right. three New York cats together in the same place <laughs> at the same time is, is, is challenging. So everybody maybe just like introduce yourself, Sammy, you're, you're, you kind of help put this all together. How with the Broadway thing, you're a rocker. Like I met you in 2005. I knew you as a rock and roll guy. And then all of a sudden I'm like kinky boots, uh, you started doing all this Broadway stuff. What, like, how long have you been doing that? Well, it's funny because, yeah, in 2005, I was not doing Broadway. I couldn't get arrested on Broadway. <laughs> of fact, you know, I just couldn't get in. Guys would say, nah, you, you, you're you not right for Broadway to rock. But then I think Broadway started to change, you know, and what happened was Cindy was doing Kinky Boots and she had a couple guys in, all great drummers, and but she really wanted me to do it. I had done all the demos for it anyway. So uh, she just basically called me. You know, she she got mad one day and fired the drummer. And then she said, "Sam's going to do it, and that's it." And then she called me. She's like, "You'll do it, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll do it." So it was it was a nice kind of backdoor entry into Broadway, you know. And so that's how I got in. Yeah, it was, was backdoor. Yeah, because you were tour you were touring and recording over the years with Cindy Lauper, and you know she she. That was her baby, Kinky Boots. And I remember going to the, the early production rehearsals where they were working out the dancing and right. you were gonna you were incorporating your rolling products. And I made the mistake of saying something to Cindy one time and she really, whoo, she bit my head off. It was awesome. I really enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> that was at New 42 where we were rehearsing, yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. So wait, Sean, wait, wait, how'd she bite your head off? Well, I forget what specifically, but, you know, she's a tried and true New Yorker. So I wouldn't say it was really right. much as biting my head off as much as just it was, you know, delivered in a very um, pointed way. Well, yeah, you know what the New York salutation is, right? You know how down here they say, hey, what's up, y'all? Down up in New York, they say, what are you looking at? <laughs> That's how they say hello. <laughs> I yeah. I love yeah, it. but now, it's funny because even on Broadway, you know, like you're saying, the reason that happened was sometimes you got to know just like on a session or any gig, when to talk, when not to talk. And Rich being young at that point, a little younger, made a comment, you know, just like, but it, you know, it's all fine. I felt good. I felt just lucky to be in the room. It was really, really cool. Yeah, it was um, a lot of fun. 
Sean, tell us a little bit about, about your background. Frozen, now we have we are connected by college. Oh yeah, North Texas connection there, uh, yep. Ed Sof. Um, so, you know, right, I wanted to move to New York right as soon as I graduated from there. So, you know, I didn't even go to my graduation. I, I, I moved to the last, after the last day of school, I moved right to New York. And, um, you know, I had a few connections here, but um, I didn't know that many people, but a friend of mine named Gary Seligson, who I knew, cause I'd always seen him touring around the country with Broadway shows and I would go wave at him in the pit. You know, my parents would take me to see these shows and I just would meet these people that would come on the road. And um, I always tried to stay in touch with them. And uh, there was no internet or Facebook back then. So I would call them from a payphone when I got to New York, or I'd write letters, things like that. I'd wait outside the stage door and, and meet them. Wow. Uh, and, and so, you know, when I moved there, I just, you know, I was, I was playing in bands, I was playing off Broadway shows, I was doing all kinds of, you know, freelance random gigs, and just started to meet enough people that w was leading me to Broadway. And Gary, who I'd met when I was in middle school, had an opening for a sub at the show Aida, which was an Elton John musical it was really hard with a lot of electronics and hard hitting. And um, it was a great show. And, and so I, that was my, my big break on Broadway was getting to sub for him. And I was so nervous doing it because it was my first time and you don't get to rehearse with, with the band before you play. Your first subbing performance is your first time playing the show. And it was a lot riding on my shoulders, but it, it went well. And then I got to serve people like Warren. I've met people like Sammy and all these, this community is really small. And so just that one show subbing for Gary opened all the doors and, and let me sub on 13 other shows and led to me getting my first show, which was spam a lot the Monty Python show. And since then I've been really lucky to have my own show and it's just been great to, to get to be creative and, and work on all these cool projects. I love that you young whippersnapper. So that was the key was, <laughs> was, was, was uh, subbing on 13 things and getting your name and face out there and getting the reliability factor up and then boom, it leads to other things. And so Warren was one of the first cats you met Warren. You're like the OG man. You're like Manhattan School of Music, 1976. Is that school around still? Yeah, they still have it, yeah. Yeah. And so, so did you finish? I did graduate. I left two weeks early to go on the road. My professors let me go. And who was the first act with? you toured What's with? That? What, like, who were you touring with? Probably you don't know them. Jackie and Roy. They're jazz singers. They were like the, some of the first people to do that vocalese thing. Syllables, oh, nice. words. And uh, that was so much fun, man. I mean, uh, you know, being on the road after four years of conservatory madness, you know, being yeah. set free. So that was great, man. So when did, you, when did you connect with Sammy? Because Sammy, you moved to New York in 1980, right? Right. Yeah, Warren, I'll, when, we didn't. I don't think Warren and I really started hanging until I started playing Broadway, which was what, 2012 or so, well, 2013. I knew Sammy because, Sammy, you worked for um, The Sun Will Come Out. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, Ed, Eddie. Eddie. Uh, and, and Francisco, right? Oh, yeah. 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 He so was playing baseball. I knew, I knew about you then, and I knew you were like Mr. Um, Electronics, plug it in, but I, I didn't know you. I know you through Roger. Right. We have a mutual friend, Roger Spatero. Customers. Yeah. Does but a lot of Broadway also. Yeah. So that's how I know Sammy. And I know Sean because um, I was looking for subs. And I think Billy Miller said, yeah, you should try Sean out. And Sean came in and did a great job. And for anyone who's watching this and doesn't understand how insane it is to sub on Broadway on one show, 13 shows, it's like being a big <laughs> picture. You know, the relief pitcher for 13 baseball teams. You know, it's kind of bad. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've been in the pit up with on some of Sammy's shows, and it's great. You know, he's got his little coat rack there, and he's got his water, <laughs> and he's, it's, it's in his own little private Idaho up there. And I'm looking at this miles-long shards, and he's got trigger pedals everywhere. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, my God, if you're subbing this show and you don't get to rehearse with the band, there's a conductor involved, there's clicks, there's tracks. That would be a lot to prepare. I mean, wow. Yeah. It's like uh, rescuing hostages, you know, like the Navy SEAL dudes that go over the routine <laughs> over and over. Yeah. No matter how many times they do it, the helicopter blows up, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what subbing is like, I'm, you know. 
it it can you get yeah it's it's something man it's it's intense the rich redmond show will be right back those who are self-employed especially musicians think home ownership is unattainable for bruce klein it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician but once he did man was it satisfying so he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey if you're a self-employed musician he can help go to musiciansmortgage.com powered by movement mortgage Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS number 39179. NMLS consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Every show seems to have its own like personality or each book is like, well, on this show, you might have to do some, say it's Lion King or something. You might have to double on some hand drums and then, oh, you got a little xylophone over there and a glockenspiel and there's some more castle chimes. And, oh, I got a timpani over here. And so it's like the education on that stuff, I'm sure has kind of come in handy, not even to mention the reading chops, odd times, uh, crazy forms, Dal Segno, Dal Coda. You know, it's like <laughs> that stuff pays off, right? I mean, I don't know if somebody wants to jump in on that stuff. You know, okay, I'm going to jump in because I can. Because um, <laughs> you're the OG. <laughs> the, the reading thing is not such a big deal. The reading thing is important when you're putting a show together. Right. Because when you're putting a show together, you're going to show up during the preview period and there's going to be a list you know, cut measure two, do this, go there. And, you know, really got to be sharp, man, because, you, you know, to follow these directions. But as a sub with the reading, you've gone over this thing so many times and even as a regular, but the preview period, you really got to be able to read. You got to be, you got to be like studio musician on a jingle session, you know, make that a five, four bar, put a quarter note there and they don't wait for you. They say it and they go ready, three, four, go, you know, mm -hmm. that's an intense period. But after that, I think they call Broadway terror followed by boredom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Nashville studio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, uh, unless these guys have something different to say. Well, I, I mean, I don't know, could, I don't. Wait, a so. sub could mem memorize a show, basically. I mean, you could not read at all, and, and you get to come and watch as many times as you want. You can record it. You get a videotape with the conductor. So technically if a sub is doing a show that's been open for a while, they could, they could learn it by ear. You just have, as long as you're good enough at following the conductor and, and, and fitting in with the band and, and knowing where you are in the music. Um, you know, when I first started subbing on Aida, I just, I memorized the whole show cause I was so nervous and I just wanted to have it in my body. So I, I barely looked at the charts on that because the other thing is the conductors always want you to be staring up at them. And so the more you have internalized, you know, the more you can be looking up and, and focusing on things because sometimes things go wrong and you got to be able to jump around. So, um, so that is important. But yeah, the reading is important when you're starting a show or if you're um, doing a reading of a show, which is a developmental version. Sometimes you have to read piano charts or lead sheets or lyric sheets. Like sometimes you get nothing and sometimes you get piano, but it's rare that you get an actual drum part until you're further along, you know, with an orchestra, which is where the, where the reading really kicks in, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. No, and then, yeah. But I'm saying I'm fortunate. I didn't do any subbing because I came straight into one show, went and originated it, went into the next show and did it, and then went into a third. Nice. Who's so bigger I've been, than you, Sammy? Who's bigger than you? <laughs> no, I'm just saying no I've, been spa I've been spared, but I've seen the terror on my subs because my shows, I was basically running all the clicks and loops and, you know, I had a joke. It was like they were calling me the semiconductor because the conductor would give me the signal and then I would start and run the show. <laughs> but um, 
I just remember the, the guys, you know, feeling terrorized, you know, having to the responsibility of that, where I had, you know, six months to develop that. And it was kind of, I'm being me, then they got to come in and be me and conduct and do all that stuff too. You know, Sean did yeah. a lot of that, did a lot of that too. And, uh, I know you you would use a bunch of stuff oh, when you were running yeah. things. Yeah, running running loops and clicks is a whole new level of of terror for subs because they can literally bring down the whole show if they mess up. And you know, in Frozen, we were we were triggering things that would set off special effects and lighting and sound cues. So it, sometimes it all comes from the drum chair because we're sometimes we're running Ableton um, off of our pad and we're leading. This, we have this computer that runs the whole show computer that links everything with time code. So it, it can get very complicated and it's a lot to ask of a sub. Um, to do that but you know we're, we're so lucky to have these great subs who are very brave and great players and very dependable and they come in they learn it so well and they write everything in their book so so that they can be ready you know to do anything that you have to do in the show plus sound like you and copy all your fills and all the ghost notes i mean um yeah the subs are, are really great we're lucky to have wow them. nice now like wow because if i'm thinking if the if the conductor is counting on your the whites of your eyes that to be there like for me my I was talking to Kenny Aronoff about this it's like our weakest muscle is our is our as our memory right so he writes everything out if i was subbing most likely so you'd have to figure out how to put the music in a place where you can see the music and watch the conductor Right. But if you have a big drum set, that could be challenging as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's yeah. I mean, as a regular, when you're starting the show, I mean, I do. I can't speak for these guys. It's probably they're going to say the same thing. You have I'm always thinking the subs, you know, how to set up the music stand so you could turn the music, see the TV screen and peripherally see the drums. Right. Because some guy's going to come in and, you know, it's. You want him to be able to see that floor tom out of the corner of his eye, you know? Yeah. That kind of stuff. You're, you, you want the yeah, machine I've, to run well. Yeah. Yeah, I've got mine all on video. I've got all my runs on an iPad because I didn't want to be turning pages because I had too many other things to be doing. Yeah. You know, so and so I just get every guy gets his own PDF and he can write in his own notes. That's and right. When he gets it all what he wants, we put a PDF in there and then it comes up on a big screen. And then that, that can be kind of put in a place that's more ergonomic because that's the problem with a lot of the setups I saw on Broadway. Like the first time I was in a pit was actually was with Sean. I came down and, and, and sat in with him. It was the first time I'd ever been in a pit. And I was like, OK, he's got this laid out pretty well. And, and then I saw other pits where guys were like, they're like this and they're playing this way. Oh, uh, yeah. And you, you don't know, ever want to have to turn sideways the whole show. That's right. Fun. And, you know, playing eight shows a week, you know, you can get hurt by, you know, just not being set up correctly. Ah. So it's, it's really important to, to put stuff to where it's, it's ergonomically right and not making you strain. Just like even playing, whenever you play your drums, you know, people, I'm surprised how some guys don't set them up ergonomically and for like ease of movement. movement. Sure. So, the, so eight shows a week, that's taxing and you know, your chops are going to be razor sharp, but the whole idea behind the subs is so you guys can have a life. You're, you're, you're allowed a certain number of times a year that you can miss the show for things like, Oh my God, my, my, my wife's going into labor right now, or I've hurt myself, or I just want to go to Bora Bora, you know, for the week. So you can send the sub, right? Am I right there? Yeah, but it's, it's also for gigs. So, you know, we're allowed to take off 50% of the year, which is one of the best things of the Broadway contract. Wow. So we can take any gig we want. If we have a sub, if we have subs that are, that's why it's so important to have good subs, because if you're not there, you don't want people getting angry. So we have these great subs. So if we get called for a gig last minute, we can call someone and say, can you play tonight? And they can say, yeah. Or if we want to go on the road for a little bit, you can take a leave of absence. Or if you want a night off, that's why it's it's hard not to stay fresh on Broadway because whenever you don't feel fresh, you just take a night off and you know you can make it up next week. And so uh, that 50% thing is, is one of the best things about Broadway, being able to to miss whenever we want and stay fresh with other gigs and not not lose our connections with other musicians and have time off. That's That's one of my favorite things. Nice. Well, you know, in, in, in my world, you know, uh, bringing in three chord songs to life and, you know, hanging out with a lot of the same guys <clears throat> for 20 years, a lot of stuff is on a handshake. But you guys are talking about contracts. So we're talking the person from the AFM, the uh, New York City is there with the time card and the <laughs> clock and, the, and you're signing your life away. I mean, it's a good gig, right? Does, does each show, um, I'm going to get a little nosy here because I guess people want to know this stuff. 
um, because the kids coming out of music school, is this going to be an option for them when this all opens up and stuff? Is it a certain pay scale that has to be met as a minimum and then each show might actually pay above that? Or how does that all work? Or is everybody well, making the same? No, and everybody's not. It's, they have what they call doubles. You know, so if I'm playing the drums and then I hit a, a bongo, that's a double. Nice. So your whole thing, it's like a recording session, like a real recording session. You know, you, you play the alto sax and then you pick up the flute. It's a double, right? So it's that kind of arrangement. I think in the old days, really old days, there was a little bit of, you know, give the drummer a double and give uh, the trumpet player a double. You know, the <laughs> under the table kind of just give them, you know. Eh, I don't know if th that's going on so much. Anymore, you know? <laughs> no, the, more, the more you have, the more you get paid. And especially if you have electronics, it's cool because the synthesizer in the 70s, everyone was scared of synthesizers. So they made a 25% premium. So if we have an Octopad or any kind of pad or a click, that's an automatic 25% on top of the salary. So that really adds up if you have that plus a lot of extra percussion stuff and hand drums, you can really, you can really start piling up, which is, which is great. I see why Sammy's got all those pads and pedals and stuff now. <laughs> Gotta get paid. Gotta get paid. Oh my God. That's but great. He doesn't need all of those pedals to get paid. That's like what Sean was oh, saying. Yeah. You can just Even have one. Even if it was simply an octopad and he hit it two times, he's going to get the 25% premium. Yeah. yeah, so there's nothing gratuitous in there, you know. Right. There are guys that do that, though. Like, they always bring that gem base so they can get that hand drum double, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and I get it, but, you know, it's like, I think the three of us here pretty much is like, if it doesn't fit in the show, we're not going to put, you know, I'm not going to put in some kind of weird African percussion if it doesn't fit. Yeah, right. Right. But, yeah we're serving, but, the, serving the music. But you still want to get the premiums, you know, it just makes it a, a better paycheck and especially for the subs, you know, it makes it a better pay paycheck for them as well. Yeah. It makes it worth your while, you know. But one tough thing with the, the with the new Ableton and Clicks and all that is we're getting a double to play electronic sounds or to start a click maybe, but we're not getting paid extra for the pressure that's riding on you from running time code and sending special effects and all that stuff. It's just still that synthesizer. So I'm hoping one day in the future, I know Sammy's worked a lot on this, we could have a, a, another premium for, for when you're doing stuff other than just hitting sound, like, you know, hitting a, a rim sound or a tambourine sound, you know, we're doing a lot more involved things. Um, it's not just a synthesizer a lot of these times in, in the right, recent like shows. In, in Frozen, Sean was, was uh, doing effects that were on stage, like lighting effects, not getting paid extra for that. That's all, he could have just been triggering a hand flap sample and gotten the same amount of money. Right. Right? He's got all the responsibility to make sure that these icicles come out of the floor, you know? It's like, <laughs> you get paid for that shit. That does yeah. seem like it's, it's crossed the line a little bit there. That's like, should be like a lighting guy thing or a stage manager or a sound guy. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's a tricky situation. But, I, but it is nice when the drummer can do it because if a conductor does it or a stage manager does it, sometimes they're not going to hit it right on the downbeat or right on the end of a song. If the drummer's doing it, it's always going to be right with the kick drum. So I think it's it's so cool when it does come from the drums because it can have more impact, I think, especially like at the end of a big song, you want to hit the button right with it. Um, so that's one, one good thing for having the drummer do it instead of the conductor or a stage manager. Yeah, I remember doing one particular tour where we had some pyro that was supposed to be right in time. One, two, three, and four. And it was always like, you know, I'm got G, G, G. <laughs> it was like, oh, come on, man. You know, uh, but, but it, it is more responsibility. Uh, you know, that, 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 that software could do so much nowadays. Do you guys have redundancy? Like, is there like two Ableton rigs that the production mm -hmm. owns and then the sub comes in and just uses that because for the sub to come in and go, Oh my God, I've got to have this programmed or. Yeah, no, they use all the programming that's there, but we always have two computers running at the same time. And there's an, I have an AB switch, so I can always flip if there's a problem. Nice. Wow. Incredible. And I mean, you guys have done so much. And when Sean, when I'm looking at your resume, I'm looking at the idea of the origination, this idea that you helped originate the Book of Mormon, spam a lot, nine to five. So what does that mean, the origination? That's where it's coming from, the, like kind of what Sammy did with Kinky Boots? And, yeah, and that's where, yeah, yeah, that's where you get to be creative. It's the, it's the most fun part. I feel so lucky every time I get to do it, where I um, usually come in and it's usually just a piano player and the drummer and a few actors. 
And like I said earlier, sometimes you'll get a piano chart for a song or a lead sheet for a song, a lyric sheet maybe, or maybe sometimes they're just going to come in and jam with you. Like I remember sometimes on Mormon, we would do that. They would just be jamming and we'd play along. Um, and so the first one is usually like that. Sometimes it's not even the whole show and you play with uh, no microphones. So you have to be able to play really soft, but keep the energy up. And, and then maybe you'll do a second one of those where maybe they'll add a little bigger band, maybe a bass player or a synth player. Sometimes the singers will start to get mics and the arrangements will get more elaborate. And um, so we're, you know, we're just making up our drum parts um, early on, which is so fun because sometimes we're not being told what to play. We're, we're allowed to just come in and play like a band and, you know, jam on these songs. And um, knowing that what we're playing is going to be orchestrated on top of to make the whole sound of the show is, is a really cool feeling. So a lot of times you have to, maybe you're playing more in these early developments to get sound effects and like triangles and someone's jumping, so you're hitting a crash. But then when later on, when you have the orchestra and all the sound effects, you might not have to play as much. Um, ah. But so you're there a lot, a lot of times in these shows now, the drummer is there on the very first day. So you're there the whole journey. Most of these shows, you know, are a two to five year journey from the first workshop to Broadway. Sometimes you have to yeah. go out of town with the show and, and do it a few months. Um, but it's it's fun when you get to be, when you get to be there from the beginning, it's not like, you know, a violin player who's coming in on the first day of orchestra rehearsals and sight reading, you know, we're part of the production. And yeah. so it's, it's a really cool feeling to, to get to be, be on it from the ground floor. That's awesome. So you're helping like essentially write the drum book. And Warren, I'm sure that you've been part of that over the years as well. I've done it a, a lot, a real lot. Nice. Um, yeah, it's challenging. And, um, you know, sometimes like Sean was saying, they'll, they'll say, do this, do that. You know, it's hard to explain this, but when you're in that mode, the director and the choreographer and the, they're creating, you know, it's like being in Lennon McCartney's room there. They're creating and they're really doing it. And you really got to be sharp and stay with them because out of nowhere they'll go, I, can I have a, something, a high, a ding over here? And you've got to do it and you've got to somehow write it in. And if you don't come in, if they start again and you're like not with them, they're not happy, but this is when they're doing their creative, this is when they're doing their creative thing. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's a lot of different approaches. And I know Sammy, you, I've talked to you about this. You'll actually impose a lot of ideas for them. You'll, you'll watch them moving around and you'll kind of orchestrate right on the spot there a little more. Right. Yeah. You know, again, I was fortunate my first time in being Cindy's drummer for what, 12 years at that point. So she trusted me a lot more. So, you know, there was one time where I was playing and I was like, not sure, am I supposed to do more, play less? And then I was kind of bored. I'm like, I saw this, uh, one of the dancers do this thing. So I said, I'm going to hit that next time we do it. So I just hold, dun -dun 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 and the conductor, the uh, director, Jerry, turns around, he goes, I want more of that. He goes, do more of that. And I'm like, nobody's ever tells me to play more. That's awesome. Yeah, we don't get asked to play more. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I from that point on, I really just started saying, well, I'm just going to do it. And if they tell me it's too much, I, which they would do occasionally, and I'll back off, you know. And, you know, there's always that dotted quarter, dotted quarter eighth. It's in all Broadway. So, da -da 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 all the time. They want to hear, da -da 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 -da. for some reason, da -da 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 -da. yeah, so that's the Broadway Cave. Right. That's, That's the Broadway clave. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could just uh, love from uh, from Dennis Elliott on the opening of uh, the Foreigner song. Blah, 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 bing, go <laughs> right. Donald Gita. Yeah. What goes around? You got to find. Around. You got to find different ways to do that to to make that happen. So every time you're not playing the same sure. thing, you know. It's the Charleston. So. Um, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Jim, you got a question brewing there? You know, I was just wondering about, uh, it was going back to the um, talking about the doubles and stuff like that. You know, I'd always say that, uh, does that count for the Alex Van Halen flaming gun? <laughs> There's no room that's for what that. Broadway drumming needs more of is the flaming right. gun. I mean, I guess we'd have you'd to check get a the triple. union on that. Yeah, <laughs> just lighting it on fire, the, having a pyro. Well, yeah. Gong, 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 unfortunately, is not, it's not a uh, premium. You don't get paid extra. Yeah, we're not going to pay you for that. Uh, that <laughs> that's, I think that's part of the kit, right, Sean? I, I think. It, well, actually, Warren, isn't that? Wouldn't that be Latin, maybe, or something? That might no, be. No, it was orchestral, but I don't think it is because I'm using a gong. I have one, oh. Diana. 
And I don't well, think now, I, I think, think it, that gone. Now that you I think you could sell it as two things. You could, it could be orchestral and, you know, have the pyrotechnic aspect, which opens up a whole new slew of rates you could get into. I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. No, no, we got to get this guy down to the union. <laughs> totally. I mean, this, here's the thing that's funny. A lot of these things are like, kind of like, I don't know, what do you think? So there was, at the last contract, a bunch of people got together. I guess, I don't remember if you guys were in that room trying to figure out the doubles and how to make this better, more clear. Is this a double? You know, like you're talking to Gong. So I reached out to my friend in California and he sent me the California recording session doubling thing, which I guess Amla Richards put together. Yeah. Man, is that thing specific. Oh, man. Wow. There's, not, there's no doubt about is that little gongy thing a double or not. In New right. York, if you look at the union book, it's from 1918. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the doubles, did you guys ever look at that book? Oh, yeah. It's called Traps. Right. And the the traps. Traps. Yeah. Well, then you get into this thing of is the cowbell and the woodblock part of the traps? Or, right. you know, then it gets into this, you know, weird well, space. I mean, Emil, Emil and Jeff Picard, uh, not Jeff Picard, but um, Picard's Joe. dad. Uh, Joe, Joe, they were so, they were so forward thinking. I mean, Emil was so smart. He owned all the instruments. Then he rented all the instruments mm -hmm. to the studio and then got paid for all the doubling and probably to be the percussion section leader. So like he was really smart. God rest his soul, man. Uh, we had yeah. I had Wally Walfredas uh, on and he was talking about the sound that they used in Star Wars. He said Chewbacca, but I think it was for the sand people. And what they actually used no. was one of ML's giant trash can cuica. So the cuica, you know, for the listener that doesn't know anything, it's a Brazilian instrument. It's like a little coffee can and it's got this little tube on it and you wet this sponge and what the oh, 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 it makes that kind of sound. So ML had this huge trash can one and he gets big gardening glove and he would take it, he'd be like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and that was the sound of the of the sand people in Star Wars. I'm like, wow. what? I had no idea. Crazy. Well the so, whole Foley artistry is actually quite fascinating. If you ever watch yeah. even when the lightsabers would clash with each other, you know what that sound effect is? What was that, Jim? It's it's taking, I believe it was a baseball bat and hitting a guy wire for a telephone call. Oh yeah. Just a, that's what it, that's yeah. where they got it. Wow. So creative. So yeah. creative. I'd love I to love, be, I'm fascinated with Foley. Well, Foley is so is closely related to percussion. It's almost like you remember the Blue yeah. Man group or something or Stomp. And it's like, okay, we gotta make it sound like this guy's getting punched and some guys in the studio, like hitting like a chicken breast or like a, you know, I'm like, that sounds fun. We're getting paid for that. I love that. <laughs> Didn't they have a Foley guy in the uh, SpongeBob on Broadway? I think they had a guy that was like a dedicated. Yeah. He was, out, he was visible. visible. It was cool. Yeah. Well, Broadway is an extension of old school radio. Uh, you know, basically when you did theater of the mind, they would have, you, you had a lot of that. You, of course, you got the visual aspect of Broadway, but for, for the, I think they integrated a lot into that, didn't they, over time? I mean, as it developed? Well, a lot of times, it's, it, yeah, it come, went to vaudeville and came, descended from there. Um, a lot of times yeah. we're asked to do sounds like that, and they'll want us to do something very specific. And I'll be like, well, a drum can't make that sound. So that's a lot of times when I'll turn to samples. We can just get the actual sample if they want. I can play the, the pad. Right, yeah. but here's where it gets interesting is when you're in those, like you were talking, Sean, the, you know, the piano and drum mm -hmm. thing and the choreographer is like, you know, hyperventilating. <laughs> that, that boom, boom, that thing. And you, you really got to be quick on your feet to mm -hmm. yeah. do something to help this guy along. Imagine oh, yeah. its creation there, you know. Yeah, I always have a China symbol there because that can be so many things. It could be a huge explosion. It could be a gong. It can be scary, you know, you can scrape it. So it's, it's good you have something like that, like a china and a floor tom can, can go a long way in those rooms because it can I also be loud, yeah. You know, it's so funny, the, the, the reason why we're all together today is like, I, like everything I talk about in life is relationships. And I know you guys are all products of that. Um, Sammy, I saw Sammy in a DVD concert with Cindy Lauper in 2004, back when we had DVD players. I have totally drank Kool-Aid. I don't have a DVD player. I don't have a 
cassette player. I don't have a CD. I, I don't have any of that. I'm like totally Spotify, like the crazy millennials. Right. <laughs> and anyways, I reach out to him on my space and we become, right. we become fast friends. And every time Sammy gets an, an email or a text, I'm in New York city. He's like, Oh, great. Rich is going to ask to stay at the Brownstone, um, but but he, you're always welcome. He, I've, I've I've got and I, I, we always have such a great time. But a funny story is I said, Sammy, you don't own a car, and he goes, No, it's New York City. I don't own a car. I, I said, Well, yeah, but what if you have to go to like you know the tri-state area and play a wedding or something? He goes, I don't play weddings. I was like, <laughs> he was just he was just like so owning his space. He's like, Dude, I'm I don't play weddings. We, so now do you guys like if they because they always say like i used to, my friend brian delaney you guys know brian delaney oh yeah that's awesome great, great cat right so he's like man when when you own a car it doesn't belong to you anymore it belongs to the city of new york you know <laughs> so do you guys own cars or do you do the the sammy yeah, i have i have a car yeah and i have a spot in my building and so, they charge you extra every month for it right you had to buy yeah, it or something by new york standards it's such a modest amount it's not even great. I'm like the Sultan here, you know, man. <laughs> I've never had a car. I've never had one, never wanted one. Um, if I've ever had to bring drums to a gig, I would rent a zip car maybe, which are the hourly rental cars you can get. Or, uh, mm. you know, you can throw stuff in a cab. But we're so lucky that most of the clubs here have kits. Sometimes they're not the best kits. But um, you can survive in New York without having a car and just taking your cymbals and snare around um, on the train. But I do have a subway kit that I can take on the train with a 16 inch bass drum. If I need to, I keep that in the storage room at my apartment just in case. But wow. yeah, most, most places have, have the kits there. Yeah. Cause I love how every major drum manufacturer is like, this is the New Yorker kit. And right? you, you just put it on your back, like in a backpack. I'm like, come on, by the time you get to get the hardware and everything, yeah, you're like, you look heavy. like an idiot. It's yeah, <laughs> it's not happening. It's like carrying two people on your back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Now, where in the city are you guys live in Manhattan proper? Or are you living in the boroughs? I'm, I'm in, in Manhattan. Yeah, we're both, we're in Manhattan. Manhattan. We're both from Sammy. Yeah, I'm not where, Warren. Where are you now? I don't even know. I'm uh, on 215th Street, Inwood. Okay, so we're all up there. Uh, the Sport and Dival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're all up way uptown, us up from Manhattan. Yeah. yeah, they call it Upstate New York City, where I live. <laughs> Uh, upstate New York City. Upstate New York City. <laughs> upstate Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I also am thinking about some of the other players in the scene. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to have like, it's so hard to manage people talking at the same time on Zoom. But I know that you got um, Andres, right, from Hamilton. Mm -hmm. You got the Clint, the Gannons. And who are some of the other guys? Well, there's Larry I mean, and Madeline. Larry, Ray Marchica, yeah, Gary Sullivan, all these people I was listening to growing up, people like Warren and Ray and Gary, um, you know, were so inspiring growing up hearing them on these records. There's a record that, that Warren did. It's called The Life. Everybody should check it out because it's it's the most funky Broadway album I think ever recorded. And and he just sounds so good on it. It's it's kind of like it's set in 70s New York. It's about hookers and stuff. And there's these grooves that Warren plays and it's just, it's beautiful. And um, hearing that, wow. Thanks. in college just like that was one of the things that made me say i want to do this and i was like how do i and and to this day i've always been like i want to play on an album that sounds as good as the life and I, I don't think i've done it yet but i'm always you know reaching for that um so you know those those kind of things have always been you know special to me and, and getting to meet warren when i moved here um after hearing that you know it was such a cool thing and then i got to sub for him so you know it it works like that where um if you come here, you get to meet these people that you look up to, and then sometimes they give you work, and um, it's just this this crazy relationship that happens. And you know, and so I always try to help the next generation that's coming. I let them come watch me and try to give them work. And um, you know, it's like a cycle. And and people like Sammy, you know, Sammy's one of the nicest people in in the business, and mm -hmm. just everybody knows that. And um, you know, he gives back so much. So I'm always trying to to learn from these people and, and give back to the next generation. Um, cause it really is, it's a small community and everybody knows everybody and everybody now wants to work with nice people and, you know, there's no room for, for jerks anymore. And, um, so I'm just always, always trying to think of that. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and plus so the love, level, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Rich. No, I was going to say, you know, you guys are three world-class drummers and you're all members of the mutual admiration society, which is, <laughs> which is so great about drummers. Cause it doesn't exist in a lot of, 
you know, other like highly competitive, like, you know, bass players don't hang out. I mean, I've never seen two bass players. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're very envious of each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're very catty. Sammy, yeah. what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, you know, it, it's interesting. The, 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 to me, like Broadway's become much more interesting. You know, it's become more rock, more, much more forward thinking musically than it was. It's not just like, hello, Daleks, you know? Yeah. I mean, so it's become a, a nice, just, just to be able to play rock kind of music on Broadway or their version of it, you know, whatever it, it always, you know, you know, that joke, no matter how hip you try to make it after five minutes, it's all hello, Dolly. Cause <laughs> it does have to still fit in that Broadway scene. It's what it's yeah. still Broadway. You know, it's, it's not a rock show. Yeah. But they've 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 made like you know Sean you know speaking of you know, Andreas that you know Sean was the originator of that show too of Hamilton he was he did that whole show uh, well Andreas was out doing something else and then Sean originated then handed it off so you know that's a nice book I mean when he did his clinic two years ago at the PAS and he had the the you know the um, the chart scrolling by on the big screens I was like everything was completely notated but it was all very, very hip drumming. Like it was like oh, yeah. drumming you would do if you weren't reading. You, he just happens to have to read and to get, get all the hi-hat openings and everything. Mm. Part of me thinks like, it's really interesting. It's like, I just turned the big five O and people are like, oh, you're a kid. And then other people are like, oh my God, are those your original teeth? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, start, I start to think like, what could I, would I ever work in New York City? I think to myself, like, if I had, like, the gift of, like, several lifetimes, it would be kind of exciting. Like, every time I visit Sammy, I'm like, oh, I can, I can walk these city streets and read these charts yeah. and do this stuff, you know what I mean? But it's, uh, you know, it's, I'm running out of time here. You'd be subbing for me. You'd definitely be subbing for me. Do you guys have, like, if you, you've been doing this for so long, is there other styles of music that, or other cities that you could see yourself living in? That's one question. And the other kind of thing that I mm -hmm. like to think is not Broadway drumming aside, who are your influences, your childhood influences? Like what got you into drumming? Uh, so for me, well, the, th the thing about New other cities, I don't, I could never live anywhere else, but New York. And I always knew this was the place for me. Um, yeah. But, um, the things that got me into drumming was, um, uh, well, my dad and my uncle were both drummers. So they would, they were showing me basic beats when I was a kid, you know, Beatles things and things like that. But then I got into Brian Adams, uh, reckless. That was the, the big album for me as a kid. Um, Mickey and Curry. From there, oh yeah. And Jim Valance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so, so from then it went to like, um, uh, poison with Ricky rocket. So I was nice. like, and, and Motley Crue, those, those metal things. So I really wanted to do that. But then, uh, then I heard like Dave Weckl and, and started getting into that stuff and getting into jazz. And then I got into Broadway and I was, uh, you know, I, I shifted my goal from being a heavy metal drummer to being a Broadway drummer, um, which is a you know big shift. But then, you know, going to North Texas and studying a lot of jazz and other music, I would, uh, you know, I got a lot of other influences with like, yeah. you know, Tony Williams and Brian Blade and Keith Carlock and Bill Stewart, all those kind of guys. And so I've always tried to find a way to get those influences into my Broadway gigs. Um, so I'll try to find a way in, like if it's a, if it's a show that has some big band in it and some studio stuff, I'll try to think of how Vinny would do it. Maybe I did a show called Violet that was kind of rootsy. So I was trying to approach it like Brian Blade would do it um, with Frozen. Matt Chamberlain played the movie soundtrack and Matt's one of my favorites. So I was trying to find a way to get Matt's vibe into the show so, so there's always, that's the cool thing about Broadway is that a lot of it's, it's always trying to sound like something else. So there's always influences you can get from the music that it's based on and bring them in. And a lot of times we have to be chameleons and do, we have to be a different drummer on every song sometimes, which is another really cool thing. But it's great if, if you have those influences from all the other kind of music and all those other drummers, you can bring them into Broadway and make, make it more real. And it's not, yeah. it's not going to be like just a fake Latin. You're going to be like, oh, I'm playing real Latin because I've studied that, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that, yeah. that having those influences is so important. So you're not just, you know, you don't want it to be synthetic. Nice. That was a great answer. Warren, you're up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, no, my father, like, uh, he was a jazz fan. And Joe Jones was a family friend. Papa Joe wow. Jones. I know wow. that's insane. He used to come out and visit us in Long Island and Sunday afternoons. And 
Then my father passed away. Joe actually played at my bar mitzvah. I know wow. you can't wrap your brains around that, but he actually did with the studio. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. He played a concert set in the middle of it. But after that, you know, like everyone else, my generation, the Beatles, hello. And then, of course, Dino Donnelly completely killed me and John wow. Bob. And, then, you know, then the modern era, Steve Gadd and all these guys. And and people, there's always, yeah, like Keith Carlock, there's always people doing it. I don't know what I live somewhere else. I'm always thinking about it. Like, well, is this it? You know, am I just going to be here on 215th street? And I know like, you know, people, they move, they move to different places. I can't. Yeah, but I mean, once you experience New York and the cultural and the, the forward yeah. thinking and the, your, the opportunities, like, you know, can't imagine. You know, it's, you know, music for us is uh it's a habit. It's, I don't know what guys, Stop. I don't know what that means. Stop. I'm still always thinking about it. I'm, I got the practice pad out. I'm, you know, it's just like, it's what we do, you know? So, yeah. uh, but I know people do move to other places. I heavy hitters too, you know, maybe I, you know, a lot of guys moved up to like the Woodstock area. They're more famous type of people. They're more airplane guys, meaning they can live anywhere. You know, the Dijonets and Jerry Murata and these, they go, to their gigs on airplanes, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. It's a good question, but yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah man. Sammy, who was your child? Who was your, what, so everybody, you know, says 1964. I mean, we just kind of like celebrated that, you know, the Beatles, that was like a pivotal thing. Was, was that your thing? Were you watching the Ed Sullivan show? Oh, I definitely saw it. I was you know, about eight years old at the time, you know, and right. I'm from a big family. I'm one of 11 kids, you know? Wow. And so, you know, I, when I saw the Beatles, I was like, oh, I can get noticed a little bit being a drummer, you know. But, you know, I just saw Ringo, and I knew right away, I'm like, I'm playing drums, you know. And my mom would always say, you need something to fall back on. I'm like, uh-uh. There was, like, no plan B. It's like, I'm going to play drums. That's it, you know. So, you know, growing up, you know, loved Buddy Rich. Don't play at all like him, you know. Can't play big band to save my life, but... um I love Buddy. You know, I just loved his whole tenacity and his, you know, fire. It was him, sure. John Bonham, you know, and and then a friend when I was 19 turned me on to Tony Williams. And I was like, holy shit, you know, this, he was just like, you know, <laughs> he was into his whole rock thing there with, with Lifetime. Lifetime, yeah. Hitting so hard and just, you know, that really, I just loved the way his hi-hats were all sloshy and, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I, I kind of put some of that into my thing. And then, you know, also then, you know, Ringo and Charlie, the simplicity of those guys. And then Sly, you know, all the music Sly was doing with, with Andy and um, his original drums, based on his name. Awesome. Um, uh, oh, Greg Errico? Yeah, Greg Errico and Andy, you know, those two guys, you know. And Andy had a big influence on me, just the way he would take a beat and displace something, you know. But, you know, in my head, I was always a rock drummer. I was going to be a rock drummer and just be the hardest hitting rock drummer with a little bit of funky undertones from the slide thing, you know? But I also feel like you've had a million eras of your career for such a young man. I mean, it's like for a long time, you were like the number one drum programmer in New York city. And you were walking around with a refrigerator rack full of electronics. And then one day you're working with cameo and do, 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 do. Right. Yeah. Word up. And I'm like, how many yeah. times have I played that in a pep band, you know, or God forbid the marching band arrangement of that, which I have <laughs> done, um, regrettably. So cool. I mean, that was a yeah. whole other era of your life. Well, I, I was fortunate to have a lot of different things, you know, going from playing in rock bands and then getting into programming and then playing with Cameo and touring with them a bit and being able to make those records, which was an amazing time of my life, you know, and then getting kind of out of programming because that's all people wanted to hire me for. And I was like, I, they, they would forget that I was actually a drummer and that was really yeah. where my heart was. But the programming was a great part of it. it really taught me a lot about drums because you had to put it together and see how does all this fit, you know, and then about making records and that too, you know, and then it just kind of all just came around back to playing live again and which I really enjoy. And now I'm, you know, mixing up, all of it. I have programming live. It's all going together now. It's just kind of all come, come and congealed, you know? 
Totally. Now, 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 Sammy, Sammy, you have your space where you where you have um, your recording for people in your space and it's all ones and zeros. You send files, PayPal. It's, it's I love it. You know, it's almost like an expectation nowadays. Do you got, do you guys have a little space that you go to or you can kind of work out of for those kind of things? Is that part of your musical diet? Yeah, I've I've um I've always managed a recording. You know, when I was a little kid, I had a you know a Vestax four track, and it just kept expanding from there. Yeah. And so that's one of the challenges of living in Manhattan is you don't have you can't have the drums in your apartment. So you know, I rent a space. Um, it's called the Music Building. Um, you know, everyone's rehearsed there. There's a lot of rock bands. Madonna used to have a room in there. Um, but I got lucky because I have a room on the top floor, and I usually go after I drop my son off at school. So early in the morning, there's no one there. It's quiet, and my room sounds great for recording. So I have, you know, all my mics set up. I can store all my gear there. I can have rehearsals in there. Um, and and during the pandemic, I've been really lucky that I've been able to do a lot of home recording there. And it's kind of been so lucky that I have that because when someone sends me something, I can do that, and I don't have to turn down the work when we can't all play together. It's it's been it's been great having that. But yeah, I do think you need that that space because um, it's just so hard to to keep your your playing up if you're not getting to hit hit the drums all the time. That's true. I, I felt like I was a little rusty during the pandemic. I was ex- took a break from the drums like maybe the first two months. Like I don't think I picked up a pair of stick. Like I literally I was like, <laughs> this is the world telling me like after playing drums for. 44 years to just like take a month or two off you know i was pursuing some other things but then you pick up the sticks again mm. you're like oh wow these diddles <laughs> are uh that's okay okay so but then you, you know you it's just like muscle memory it comes right back mm-hmm. what about you warren well you know i lived in the suburbs for a million years and always had drums set up and then i moved back to manhattan nine years because uh working on broadway and commuting was just unbearably bad so <laughs> i've always had um i've always had a show with not big interruptions in between so i would go down there and you know a lot of playing i mean a show plus other gigs and if i needed to play the drum set i would go to the show early and or the day off but now i don't have that i have v drums in the house and nice. I practice pads and but it's not like hitting drums man it's uh you know, it's a lot of act as if. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, it would yeah. be. I used to have a space. Um, the music building that Sean's talking about used to be on 50th and 7th. And I was there with a bunch of guys, and that went away, and now it's on 8th Avenue. And I was in that building for a while. I don't know if this continues. I'll have to figure something out. But well, that's the thing you said about having a show. It's like your Midtown office. So when you do have a show, especially if you have a drum booth, you can go and play in there and like, you know, you never feel rusty because you're, you're playing every night, but it's just nice to have a place to, to be able to hang out or drop your stuff off in your locker. Yep. And um, that's, you know, one thing I definitely miss about, about having Broadway up and running. I mean, yeah. it came on, the drums were in another part of the building and I could go in there. If there wasn't a crew c- call, you know, like the, the, the stage hand dudes doing their thing, I would always check it out to make sure I wasn't bothering anyone, but it was really somewhere else and you shut the doors and really no one could hear it. And I'd go in there and practice things that I needed to work on, but I don't have that right now. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I'm all, I got set up to, to, to do some practicing out here on the left coast and it has really, it was like, all right, enough is enough. The practice pad is not doing its thing. Like this is so fun. Like I'm a kid again. It was like so cool to be going hit and because I am um, teaching at Musicians Institute now. It's all online and I have to film this whole course tomorrow. Reading four, you know, so the kids are reading, you know, five, eight, seven, eight, nine, eight. And it's like, oh, I better go shed this. And it was so fun. So I got to record that tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Jim, do you feel like you have another question in you or is it time for that question? The random question? Yeah, how are we going to do Are we ready for the random people? question? Do I do three random do questions? One, are we going to do one question that three people are going to answer or three different questions? I think I said we do three different questions. Three different questions. Let's do it. Fun. We paid for this jingle, so. It's the random question. <laughs> right behind door number one. Question of the day. All right. We got the tension bed, too. All right, who wants to take the first one? <laughs> I'm scared. I'll Let's go, go with Sean. I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Or Sean, you take it. Who, who wants it? Go ahead. Okay. Sean. I'll go. Okay, we'll go. Sean, Sammy, Warren. Here we go. Sean, 
What's the weirdest thing you found lying on the ground or at the side of the road? <laughs> wow. Um, let me think here. Seen a lot of crazy things in New York. Um, yeah, I bet. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, the one thing that's kind of my head was was just yesterday, um, walking my son to school. We saw <laughs> we saw a rat completely flattened on the sidewalk. You know, just guts everywhere, and it was it was uh, it was really gross. But um, my son, who's kind of a comedian, started you know dancing around the corpse of the rat and said, "I'll d- I'll dance on your grave, rat." You know, and uh, it was it was pretty funny. Um, yeah, so that's probably a mild one. You know, you see lots of lots of things here, but smashed rats are are still pretty gross. Oh yeah, of course. I think the, the last the last time I did a clinic at the Drummers Collective, I saw a rat the size of a gigantic fat cat. <laughs> this thing had to be thirty five pounds. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> it was huge. Sammy, all right. Who do you feel like you know, even though you've never met them? Wow, man, where do you guys get these questions? <laughs> oh, I don't give away my resources. Uh, that's, I could actually Google. I was you like, actually boy, Google random I, questions. And find I was, I was, them. Boy, I'm glad I didn't get Sean's question. Now I'm like, boy, I wish I got Sean's question. <laughs> Who do I think I know that I don't really know? Sammy knows everyone. Jesus. Oh, man. My well, wife, you know, uh, she could tell you, it would be, to, it would be uh, Tom Selleck for my wife. <laughs> yeah. She's never, she feels like well, she knows him, but it's never met, she never met him. My, my wife thinks it's funny because I, I always remember faces, you know, so I'll tell you, there was a story I was actually, I met some, ran into somebody who I thought I knew, but I didn't know, you know, so I'm walking down the street <laughs> mm-hmm. and this beautiful redhead is walking down the street and and I'm walking, I look over, I said, I know you, you know? And she's like, yeah. And I said, yeah. So we walk like three or four blocks and I'm trying to figure this out. You know? And this is this, this, no, no, no. Anyway, finally, it's like, okay, well, I go, I'll probably figure it out as soon as I turn the corner and we split. And she says, yeah, probably. You know, and she was very pleasant and very nice stuff. She leaves, I turn the corner, I get about five steps away and I go, hell, it's Amy Adams. <laughs> so, you're kidding I, no and she was the most pleasant woman just the sweetest she was just tolerating me talking to her for three three blocks trying to figure out where i know it was like on the big screen so i guess it would be amy adams oh my god <laughs> that could have been so creepy but she was she really did it that's so nice she was awesome she was just pleasant as can be because she probably gets that all the time um, where do i know you from but right wow right. Yeah. Okay. Good one. Good one, Sammy. All right. So, uh, final question for Warren. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to come up with this one off the top of my head. I used to live in Las Vegas for four years and there are things that I know I should have done more of while living out there. Uh, you know, like visiting some of the places that, um, I may have took advantage of or took it for granted, like the Bellagio fountains. I should have visited those. I've, I've always enjoyed them. Is there anything in New York city that you feel like, you know, I should really go visit that more. Yeah. Any I'll particular you, place? This is easy. I think it's easy. All these art museums, which I go to like once at a blue moon, you know, the cultural mm. capital of the world. And it's like, you know, you pass the Metropolitan Museum rushing to a gig or something. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, more museums. Yeah. I went to you the know, museum. It's, of it's the History. cultural capital of the world, uh, second only to Nashville. I mean, anyway. <laughs> it's very true, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, I was going to say, we see, we see a flattened rat, and there's a lot of people that are like, hey, man, that's dinner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. We put that next to a mayonnaise sandwich, and we got a meal. That's so, it's so rough. So, what now? Let me ask you guys what is your favorite secret little because everyone's like oh yeah the original rays well which one is the original but what what's your secret little go-to spot that you would actually drive out of the way to go eat the food do you guys have little secrets like oh this little ethiopian spot you know that it, what is that forever 
Or does it have to I be mean, pizza? My, my's, well, mine's not little. I mean, for pizza, it would be this place called Little Italy, which there's a few of them around town, and they put the uh, cornmeal on the bottom. I don't know if you guys have had that. Oh, yeah. It's, like, it's a little extra crunchy. That's that's always my favorite New York style pizza. But in terms of my favorite restaurant that I would do anything for, it's called Budokan. And it's not a it's not a small place, but it is kind of a hole in the wall because it's in an old bank building and you have to go down these stairs. It's not marked on the outside, but when you get down, it's like this huge Harry Potter dining room with candles and long tables. And uh, it's it's my favorite place to eat a- anywhere in the world. Budokan, you heard it here, guys. Yeah. Well, I'd say for Pizza John's down on Bleecker Street, probably my favorite pizza, pizza joint. But then there's two other joints. There's Strip House for a Steak, my favorite. It's on tw- East 12th Street. There's also one in Midtown. And then Raul's, which is, is down on Prince Street, is great. Best burger in the world you'll ever eat. Mm. And they only make 12 a night, though. So you have to like get there in time for the, wow. the bar to open. You oh, can wow. only get them at the bar. 12 a night? So, 12 a night. And you, people wait out line. And they get in line. The, the place opens at 5. So people get there around 4.15, 4.30. And there's nine seats at the bar. So the first nine people pretty much you know, sit down, have a drink, and then order this burger and it's the oh. most unbelievable burger you'll wow. ever have in your life damn yeah. guys i mean when 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 we when we get to herd immunity and the streets are in new york are opening up and i come visit you guys we're going to these places mm-hmm. absolutely you're get a text from me warren you're gonna get a text from me you'll be like you're gonna you'll be like i'm not giving you my number i got your number but i'm gonna text <laughs> you and, and we're gonna go to your favorite spot which is drum roll um you know, for years, man, Pat, uh, Patsy's Pizza, 117th and 1st. That's kind of... But isn't it true that you can get out of Grand Central Station? I used to live in Connecticut as well, and my wife would get tickets, Broadway tickets every now and then. I worked for a radio station up in Connecticut, and just spontaneously, the general sales manager would walk in, she'd have a pair of tickets, hey, you and Courtney go see Les Mis. All right, hey, let's just go hop a train and head on down. You could throw a rock and hit a good pizza place. Right. I imagine living in, in Manhattan, that tends to wear off and you got to find your own. I'm, I'm a big pizza guy. So. Pats, Patsy's is like 75 or 80 years old. And it's, it's where Frank Sinatra used to go. And it's, it's, uh, the oven is 75 years old at least. And it's kind of like a legendary scene. Yeah, but you're right now, you know, all these uh, pizzas, like all these gourmet dudes, with the Neapolitan pizza. It's not like the old days. It's, it's just, no. yeah, it's, it's like, there's all these more, you know, all these joints now that have like groovy pizza. Yeah. I so, just want to yeah. fold it. You know how the New Yorkers fold it and you mm-hmm. degrease it a little bit, or you maybe like pat yeah. it a little bit, get some of those <laughs> cup of calories off of there. And then you're right. on the street all drunk at the end of the night. Just, oh God, <laughs> that sounds so fun. Wow. See, it so, took a while that, for us in Rich, Vegas. Yeah. We in did Vegas, that. Hang- it took us, yeah, we, it took us three okay. years in Vegas to find good pizza. And then in Nashville, I hit it right off the bat with Joey's House of Pizza. You know, Joey's Rich, we've been there a I couple times. I still haven't times. been. Still haven't been. You've been there. We went together, actually. Um, <laughs> there was a, there's a place. I can't, we're, we're talking about pizza now. But, I mean, these people are from Brooklyn. And they moved down here, and they've been here forever. And not only do you get, you know, lunch, and you get a show because they're constantly screaming at each other. It's awesome. Yeah. And you know the wife. The wife waits. I hi. How are you? What would you like? Go get him his calzone already. <laughs> hi. How are you? Good. You want a calzone too? We'll get you a calzone. I know. Just calzone. Get him a calzone. Oh, calzone sounds so good. Did you get the regatta cheese in there? Oh my yeah. god, man. It's crazy. Okay, this has been so fun, so informative. And I want you guys just to kind of tell us where you can be found on the web if you like to be found, Sean. Um, my website is smdrums.com, S-M-D-R-U-M-S.com. You can find me there or Facebook or Instagram. Anything's fine. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just sammymarandino.com. And you can get me on Instagram, Sammy Marandino. Love it. No Facebook. I'm off of that. Are you really? Yeah, I've been off it for about a year. I just How was that, to Sammy? Is it good? Uh, I don't miss it at all. Don't miss it. Took up yeah. too much of my time, too much anger on there with people, and uh, 
got too political and I'm just like, yeah, I don't need that. It's, it's been the best thing I ever did was just to cut it off. Mm-hmm. Nice. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> never political. Never. Yeah. Everyone gets along so well. Yeah. Yeah. Warren, what about you, man? Do you like being found on the interwebs? Uh, you know what? I don't, I'm not as big as these guys. I don't have to die. <laughs> These guys are like dynasties, these two dudes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just have a Facebook thing, and that does waste my time. And I go, why am I here? I have Instagram, but I never use it. And I think I even have a Twitter account that I've never been on. <laughs> oh, I really? You never did one tweet? I, no, I kind of, I just feel like I'm so overwhelmed with media as it is, you know, the phone. Yeah. The computer that I have an eye to watch that's beeping. You know, I'm, at night it's like tucking everybody in. You're tucking <laughs> in the iPad, the phone, the you know these things need to be plugged in. It's like it's like having little kids in the house. You know, that's You're true. I mean, if you, uh, hope you wake uh, up rested. <laughs> if you got AirPods and you have an iPhone and you have an iPad and you have a computer, there's four Apple products right there. You might have an Apple TV. That's just one person. Then if you have a household of people, like no wonder why they're doing so well. I mean, it, yep. but it is a sexy product. Cupertino, it's all white. The packaging is gorgeous. They really figured it out, man. I just want to give you, you know, I did, hate to do this, but give a shout out. I just switched to Fios, right? This has nothing, oh, yeah? to, do, nothing to do with drumming. <laughs> so I have this Apple uh, Airport Extreme that I think Abe Lincoln used, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so when the Fios guys came, I bought this other router and they were going to use, they go, man, you don't need that. You have this thing. I go, that thing can't work in this era we're in. Sure enough, man, it, it, it can, and it does. So shout out to Apple. Big deal. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, this is, this has been so awesome guys. And I, I look forward to the world coming back so I can come see you all play. And, you know, I don't mind sitting out in the audience, but most likely I'll be that guy. I'll be like, can I get some preferential treatment and come watch you in your little <laughs> booth? Cause that's where I want to be. Um, but you guys are just great, man. You know, keeping, keeping that whole thing alive. So accomplished. This thing was so informative. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you so much. Absolutely. And uh, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. Dude, we love you, man. Thanks for your time and talent. And uh, yeah. to all the folks out there that want to give us a little praise, you got some criticism, I got an email for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And I need you to tell your friends about this. Subscribe, share, rate, review. It really helps us. Keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.